What up? Welcome to No Bad Vibes TV, and it's me, Chris the Enlightened. And you know what? Right now, I want to sort of say hello to everybody, man. Hope everybody's doing good. Um, hope you're doing good, good. So what I'm going to do right now, actually, is I had just did a couple days ago this audio, not audio, but a uh, I almost said a physical, <laughs> not an audio of my, um, not an audio. I did a video of my near-death experience, and I, I usually always do, like, maybe audios or something like that, unless I'm doing a podcast with someone or radio, then you actually hear the story. I've never really done a video, like, where I'm actually talking just to you guys about my NDE. So I want to sort of, instead of do it like all over again, I want to share with you the video that I actually, uh, the video of my near-death experience that I actually talked about it, like on video. I'm stretching right now. Probably no bad vibes. <gasps> ah, <it's> tired. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, This actually right here. It was a gift for my birthday and it was the most amazing gift in life so no bad vibes no bad vibes um what do you call it oh so yeah so here's the video i'm going to show you right now um hope you guys like it um this is my near death experience video so i will see you guys in a little bit to take you guys out enjoy the video hello so my name is Chris Batts I am a near-death experiencer um, by way of a suicide attempt <clears throat> um, before I get into my near-death experience I sort of want to break down why I had a near-death experience so I was very suicidal at the time. I had a lot of thoughts of leaving Earth way back when, since I was like four years old. Um, I do know, because I don't have much relationship, of a relationship with my mom or dad. I don't know where they are. I don't even know who they are. You know what I mean? I see my mom very few times. My dad left her when she was pregnant. I've never seen... Well, from... What I hear from my grandma when I was a little kid, she told me my dad had, <clears throat> I guess, took me around a couple times when I was a baby to get ice cream. But, of course, I don't remember that. Maybe I was a couple months old, if that. That's the only um, interaction I've ever had with my dad. So, I don't know what he looks like. Um, and I grew up in home to home, actually going home to home. Um... What ended up happening was my mother, at six months old, threw me in a dumpster. You know those neighborhood dumpsters? She threw me in one of those because I guess she wanted to get on with her life. I was a burden to her. Um, one of the times when I was five years old, when I actually did see her, she told me the reason why she threw me in a dumpster was because I didn't want. She didn't want me, and her words literally were. I didn't want you at the time. So, I mean, that's what she said. Now I think about it, I kind of laugh about it. I guess it's nothing to laugh about, but shoot. I'm happy, you know? Um, so, okay. Okay, so fast forward to after she left. Well, okay. I'll get back to when I was, uh, when after the six months old incident happened. Um, she basically what um happened was some lady found me one of the neighbors found me in a neighborhood dumpster that my mom threw me in she heard me crying i guess she was picking up her trash and lord and behold you hear like a six-month-old kid in the, in the um in the trash can crying like hey like what's going on man like i don't know if i was hungry probably was because i love food but yeah, so the lady found me, and she called my grandma. I guess my grandma was at church. So the lady calls my grandma and says, Oh my gosh, I have a baby here right now. Um, I hear your baby. This is your mom's, your daughter's child. Like, this is your grandchild in the dumpster. And 
my grandma immediately left church and pretty much from there she took me in um so from six months up until i was four she took me in um during these times, she let my mom see me every so often, but she wasn't supposed to see me because my grandma had custody of me, and she went to court for me after my mom threw me in the dumpster. And the judge told her, like, hey, you can no longer see your son ever, 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 ever again. So that's when my grandma had custody of me. <clears throat> um, so... Four years old, my grandma has a nervous breakdown. She's in the hospital for a year straight. And, um, <clears throat> sorry, sorry about that. So, a year, I mean, four years old. So, a year later, when my grandma's in the hospital, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> okay. So, a year later, my grandma's in, you know, still in the hospital for a whole year. So, at this time, I'm living with her daughter. One of her daughters, which this daughter was praying and hoping that she would die so that way she can get her money and jewelry and cars and everything like that. She wants to just wipe her trailer clean of everything so she can have it. And they were money lovers. They were mean people. So what ended up happening was my grandma was really no in no fit to take care of me. And she let my mom see me a couple times, even though she wasn't supposed to. I do remember this one time my mom came and she threw, um, she threw me off of a bus, off the city bus, because she said I wasn't walking fast enough. And actually, I still have that scar right now. It's proof. <clears throat> so, fast forward, you know, after she's still in the hospital, um, I end up um, living with her daughter. And uh, the one that was hoping that she would die. Um, I started living with them. <clears throat> they had four kids of their own from different marriages. And they had a son together. These people were like the most savage uh, foster people you can ever be around. And they treated you like... They treated me like a piece of sh crap. And um, it was crappy there. They... A lot of times I went to bed hungry. A lot of times they would say, I don't deserve food and clothes. I lived with them all the way till I'm four years old up until I was 14. So during this time was horrible for me. And um, they, a lot of, they bought, they had got their son clothes and shoes and everything. He was the, the golden child, so to speak. And I was the one that had to do all of his chores and his work and still get good grades and if you forget to vacuum or clean or wash the dishes or something because you're doing homework, you get beat. They used to beat you for everything. We went to church every single Sunday and sometimes during the week on Mondays and Wednesdays and Saturdays. And sometimes when they would have what they call a revival, you go every, like you go every day, you know, for weeks at a time. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, and these people are so, we were Baptist Christian. I need to, um incorporate this in here we were baptist christian and um these people were very mean they were very very mean and even if you in church they'll give you this look like i'm gonna beat you you know see me they used to i wasn't a bad kid they just used to pick on me at home and i had older older cousin i wasn't scared of because mind you i had nothing to me, I had nothing to be scared of. I was alone. Um, I felt like I was alone since I was four years old. I felt like I was alone. At four years old, I told myself, I'm going to grow up and raise myself. And that's what I meant. So during these years, being five, six, seven, eight years old, and I'm always getting in trouble, fighting at school, fighting at school almost every day. I had no fear. I had nothing to be scared of. And, um, so I would I would never back down from people. So at school, I'm fighting older kids, like second grade, first grade. I'm fighting fourth graders, third graders, you know, like fifth graders even, you know. I didn't care. And still, I would get in trouble for that at home. I would get in trouble for standing up for myself. I never started the problems. I was just always short and smaller than other people. Matter of fact, one of the people in the homes used to say I have short man syndrome. And they say that I think I'm so tough and I'm like a chihuahua and a poodle. They think they're so hard and all that. But And they would always threaten their son on me. I'm going to let him loose on you. And 
I would say, okay, like, I would love to take him out back and let's do this. Their son took karate and all this other stuff. They never let me. So, as I'm, as I'm at school fighting people, I'm learning, teaching myself how to fight. <clears throat> and um, also, when we go to his little karate things, I would sort of steal stuff from them, too. He played sports. I played soccer one year, and they made me quit after I took the team to the championship. They made me quit and didn't even let me go to the celebration of the the, the season. So, And uh, they basically would beat me all the time. It was abuse. They abused you. They called me names like fat boy and you're going to be like your mom. And it was bad. I had f my aunts, other aunts, they were the same way. They didn't care about me. They just would always say I'm going to be just like my mom. For some reason, they had some vendetta with my mom. So since I'm her kid, I'm the spawn of Satan in their eyes, right? <clears throat> so fast forward to, you know, years later, um, um, during high school, I got pretty popular, actually. Um, of course, I'm fighting like people like my introduction to high school was fighting some 10th grader that was bigger than me, but busted his nose and his mouth and everything. And everybody was like, oh, OK, so this kid is nothing to be messed with <laughs> you know like I had a streets taught me type of attitude but mind you I was sort of like a pretty boy I was always looking out for how I look and stuff like that and I was a girl person I loved little girls back in the day like it was nuts in high school I was so popular you know and so fast forward years later as an adult a lot of these people in high school you lose contact with and you start being alone most of the time again. You find people in the workforce, but I don't know. It's just, it's not the same. You know, you grow up and people change. So years as I'm in my friends I would hang out with would do you dirty. They were two-faced. They backstabbed you. I didn't have any family to count on. Even as a kid, I went from home to home. So at 14, I was at another home horrible situation they only you know wanted me for the money part and it was bad and people you know their own family are saying how I got it made and I'm like oh my god no I don't it sucks I couldn't watch tv couldn't do nothing it was couldn't go out with my friends they wouldn't give me a birthday party nothing like that only birthday party I had I was like five years old and that's it and the next thing I was 16 when I ran away from one of my other homes then I actually stayed with someone else, and then I had a 16 party. So, years, you know, <clears throat> so I moved, actually, the person I'm living with at 6 years old, I mean 16 years old, um, didn't last very long because they have all type of, types of bugs, and they spy on you, and then they, they tell you horrible things, like you're never going to be anything in life. And Mind you, when I was a little kid, I didn't really have clothes, like, they would give their son clothes, so I would go to school with no jacket, no, in the, it's ice everywhere, I have no jacket, no pants, so I'm in basketball shirts, basketball shorts and a basketball jersey, and the people I'm with tell me I didn't deserve clothes, so this followed me all the way, everyone I lived with told me that, you don't deserve new clothes, you don't deserve food, you don't deserve, there's a lot of things they told me I didn't deserve, like I didn't deserve to be happy but their own kids they gave everything to and one of my other aunts I moved in with that 16 and no 15 and she was the same she only wanted me for the money I got um so 16 I move in with another aunt and spies on you um She's not very encouraging. I didn't have anybody I can talk to. I needed someone to talk to, and I didn't have anybody to talk to. So that's what led to my suicidal thoughts. Um, so years later, I was just trying all the drinks, all the drugs I can, everything, so I can feel accepted. Because all my life, I never felt accepted. And that's what I was looking for, is acceptance. So I felt accepted whenever I would drink and, you know, do all types of drugs and stuff like that. Because I felt, okay, well, something makes me happy. I feel accepted. But then that starts getting old. 
my mind started to change and I didn't want to do that anymore. But what ended up happening was more and more suicidal thoughts started coming. So I started planning my suicide. I said, I'm just going to leave because I had no one to talk to. It seemed like a lot of the friends I had sucked. So I just planned it. So I said, I'm just going to plan my suicide. So I did for months. I was planning on jumping in front of a train. But as, because uh, I timed the train times in the times they come. So I was just going to lay in front of the train, let it run me over. Then I was going to drown myself. And it just didn't work out because I'm talking to one of my friends that thought were my friend and we were I was trying to confide in them and the type of friends I have don't understand sympathy they don't and that's someone that has suicidal thoughts and don't feel accepted that's the worst thing you can do is not have sympathy or should I say that's the worst thing they can feel is not having sympathy for them or acceptance so I ended up actually getting a call from my mom she calls my grandma after years of not talking to me and she calls my grandma and says i want uh chris's number and my grandma gave her my number so she calls me and says i just want to let you know before i get into this hold on as uh before she called i was walking to the train station i planned or the train I was planning to kill myself at. Eventually, the uh, friend I was with talking to at that time, she um, she pulled over and she saw me walking and said, get in the car, because she happened to be driving around that way. And um, said she had a funny feeling. So my mom calls me and says, "My," she said, your grandma let, gave me your number and I called to tell you that I don't want you, I don't love you. Um, I don't claim you. I've never wanted you. I never do want you. Don't call me your mom. And um, so at this point, I was in my friend's car. So I opened the car door. I said, and I tossed it, F you, you never were my mom. And I tossed the uh, phone out the window. And I looked at my friend as she hit the right, she hit a right corner. And I just said, F this and jumped out of the car. That's when my near-death experience happened. Um, I just remember my back of the back of my head hitting the concrete and I'm trying to yank myself out but some like up but something keeps telling me I wouldn't do that if I were you so I end up uh, being stubborn and saying okay well I'm gonna do it anyway ha huh? and um I got up but I didn't know I was out of my body then so I'm in this void and then I felt God's presence and God was like giving me a hug and telling me that he loves me and I had so many questions in my head about God slash source and before I even asked them audibly the answers came mentally and said um I am God yes I am real yes angels are real they're a gift for me want to meet them so I said nope I did not believe in angels I my relationship with Christianity and God and all that my years of growing up, I had a different opinion from the people that I knew from how religious they claimed to be. It didn't add up. So I said, OK, I didn't really care what happened to me, suicide and getting out of here. Anything would have been better than being here. That's how bad it was and how alone I felt. And um, so and then I see like God's source is showing me like this video pr presentation of people and First you see like the skateboarder guy, then you see this business suit guy, like this guy with the business suit and a briefcase, then you see this prostitute girl walking, and you see this other guy just straight up like walking with his blunt in his hand, you know, and everything. It was nuts. And um what God said was, Um, I love all of them and I love all you the same and I'm like, Wow and um so me feeling God's love, I said, Well how do I explain you if I go back to earth? And he says, go and tell everyone that I love them. And then he says, I will go to the end of the world so everyone is with me. And I never forget that. And um, there were words that popped up, like in capital letters and exclamation points. And one was um, like caring, loving. But one that really stuck out to me in capital letters was long, long suffering. And... Um, so after that, God was like, I love you. I love everybody. And it was a beautiful experience. So a few minutes, like right after that, 
literally I'm looking at angels. They're a swarm of angels, but I recognize two. One was on each side. One at one was I on my right, one on my left. They were huge. The one on my left was like a beetle like creature. And then he was stern and mean. I was like, Are you sure you wanna go? And then the other angel was more human like and was super buff. And I was thinking about the gym when I was with him. And then I looked down and saw his sandals on. I'm like, well, if you were to step on the earth, half my city would be gone. And um, so, you know, they're telling me how they love me. And I have so much to do for so many people. The one on the more muscular guy on my right side was more gentle. The one on my left side was more stern. Like, you need to go back. Like, that type thing. So I talked to the one on my right side more because he was nice. And um, so after that, they tell me to look down at my body. So I look down and it zoomed in literally like a camera. And you could see and they're like, no, look again. So I look again. They're like, there's a body. The body's right there. And I literally see the paramedics over my body. And I'm like, and my other friend on the other side on their phone. And I'm like, oh my God, that's crazy. And, um, so they told me, do you want to stay or go? I said, you know what? I will, um, go back to earth since I have stuff to do for people. And they're like, yeah, you're really loved. We need you. And we love everyone. And I'm like, wow, like I didn't get judged. I didn't feel any condemnation. Only judgment I felt is when I, from when I judged myself so I'm the one who judged myself more than anything. So I want you guys to know you're not going to be judged. Most religious people would probably disagree with me. The ones that are really how came up like I grew up, scared to have an opinion and think about certain things. But me experiencing it actually proved to me that we are loved and we are not judged. Only judgment we give is ourself. So that's what I brought back from my near-death experience. Um, in years, um, the day, days later, I woke up in the hospital. And I didn't remember any of this happened until... Oh, and at, when I woke up, the nurses were like, you're a miracle. They're calling me miracle. And, yeah, they told me, we thought you were gone. We thought you were out of here. But I'm back, baby. Um... So, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this near-death experience. I learned love. And to this day, I need to tell you, I still have a great relationship with those same guardian angels. They never left me, and they never will. And I understand them, and I hear them a lot more now. So, it's a beautiful relationship. They're nice. They have a sense of humor. I do videos that talk about it. Um... Yeah, they're amazing people. So, my near-death experience are amazing beings and they love us all. So, and everybody has guardian angels too. So, I hope you guys enjoyed my near-death experience. I want to encourage suicide. I want to basically encourage suicide prevention. If anybody's suicidal, um, tell someone. Call the suicide hotlines. Do what you gotta do. But someone loves you, I promise. And also... Oh, and God is love. God loves you. And that's what I got from my near-death experience. I love you all. So, now that you saw the video, I hope you love it. Hope you like it. I hope you go out and get turkey bacon. Okay, well, anyway, I hope you like it. Hope you love it. Hope you can't get enough of it. And, um, yeah. Uh, love and light to all you guys. If you know anyone who's suicidal, tell them to call the hotlines, suicide hotlines. Um, request me as a friend on Facebook. Uh, Chris NDE. And most of you know my YouTube. My book, Boom, Suic Boom The Life and Times of a Suicide Near Death Experience. Sir, I will leave the link to this book because a lot of what you just heard is, is actually in you know, this book. So, if anybody could use it, use it or lose it. So, it made no sense.
Anyways, I love y'all, man. Appreciate y'all. It's all love. Stay weird. Stay different. And it's all love, man. No bad vibes. And we're out.